fun. Welcome to our morning service here at Kent Street United Methodist Church. We're glad you're with us and welcome to everybody who's watching online on Facebook and YouTube. We're glad you're joining us as well. A uh, few announcements to make this morning. First, a reminder that this coming Wednesday, we're having our last meeting of our Bible study group for Lent, the study in which we'll be looking over the Gospel of John together. And so we invite you to join us for that Wednesday night at 7. Uh, next Sunday, which is Palm Sunday, uh, the Roman centurion is going to be visiting us to uh, share his story of the crucifixion of Jesus. And so we hope you can join us uh, for that. And it's hard to believe that Holy Week is beginning, but uh, the uh, week of Holy Week, uh, starting after Palm Sunday next Sunday, uh, we are having a joint Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday services with uh, First Methodist and Thrall and Allen Chapel AME Church uh, on Monday, Thursday evening at uh, 7 o'clock. Uh, we'll be having Monday, Thursday services at First Methodist. And on Good Friday evening at 7, we'll have a Good Friday service at Allen Chapel of AME Church. And then, of course, we'll have our Easter Sunday morning services here. I want to thank Ed and Betty for the beautiful uh, flowers on the chancel rail. Uh, they add so much to the beauty of the sanctuary, uh, the beautiful flowers. And speaking of flowers, I also want to remind you all that uh, if you want to get memorial uh, Easter lilies uh, for uh, Easter Sunday to have on the chancel rail, to honor or remember a loved one or a friend, um, go ahead and get the Easter lilies at the florist of your choice and let me or Ginger know uh, who they're in honor of, how many you're donating, and uh, we'll have that on the screen Easter Sunday morning. And uh, we want to have the Easter lilies here for Easter Sunday morning, which is the 17th of April. And at the close of our Easter Sunday service, uh, you may come down and get your Easter lilies and uh, take them home to enjoy with your family. But if you want to give some lilies in honor of or memory of a loved one, uh, uh, you'll be making plans to do that. And just let Ginger or me know the information so we can get that on the screen. Uh, Ed has some announcements he wants to make, and then we'll begin our service. So welcome. Three quick announcements. Number one, today's communion offering goes to Shepherd's Heart. So uh, we add that to what we normally give them together. And if you remember last year, we gave them somewhere in the neighborhood of $2,600 or $2,700, which obviously is needed in, in this day of time. Second of all, uh, today from, I think it's noon till 3 o'clock, Circleville Store is having a barbecue to help raise money for tornado victims in Granger and in that general area. So I think the plates are $15 a piece. And if, cash only. Cash, yeah, cash only. And if you're interested, you know, I know we're going to go out after lunch and pick one up. Uh, so we'll have it at home. And the third thing is we, uh, as a church, raised or, or as a congregation and and helpers raised about $350 to $370 to send to Ukraine relief. Unless there's objection, I'm gonna go ahead and send the conference, that's where the money goes, $400, the rest of it just coming out of the general fund. Unless there's some objection to that. Okay, here it comes, that's what I'll do. So if you're ready, let us stand now and join in our call to worship. For those who have not been welcomed before, you are welcome Christ here. For those who have been turned away, Christ is opening the door for you. For those who have been forgotten, God do not forget you, for God made you. Come, join together in worship of our God. We are God's love. We welcome each other in the name of Christ. Amen. And our opening hymn is number 393. Spirit of the Living God. Spirit of the Living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the Living God, fall afresh on me. Man Fall afresh on me. 
join together in our affirmation of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now the glory of Father. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of this day. 
We're thankful we can be in your house today to worship you, to sing songs of praise to you, to share our joys and concerns, and to know that you hear and understand that you are eager to act in our lives. Bless us as we seek to be in ministry as a church in our community in these changing times. We ask that you would be with the uh, the family of Leonard Shin and comfort them in their time of loss. That you would be with uh, Doug Rowe bring healing to him. That you would be with Gabe and Kim and the kids and protect them as they travel to Spain. Be with the people of Ukraine and the people of Russia and be at work to bring healing and peace and stability to our troubled world. We pray for the fire victims of Eastland County we pray for our neighbors in Round Rock and Elgin and Ranger and Circleville and other surrounding communities who <coughs> suffered so much in the tornado. We pray for uh, those who are working to help them rebuild. We pray for healing and new beginnings for them. Be with Marie Warnke and bring healing to her. Be with Denise as she cares for Marie. We ask that you be with Julie Graham, and she will soon be well. Bring uh, comfort to the, to the family of Sandy Trussell <coughs> in their time of loss. And uh, be with David and Ed as they continue to heal <coughs> from their knee surgeries. Be with Betty Pittner as she is at home continuing to heal from her fall. We lift up to you all the other names on our prayer list and the names not written down or spoken aloud but are very real in our hearts, we lift it up to you, trusting you to be at work in these situations as only you can. Bless us as we have Holy Communion together this morning. May it draw us closer to one another and to you. And bless us as we worship and as we go forth from this place to serve. May we live as Jesus taught us to live when he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the dying is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now we have a message for our young disciples. And uh, I want to show you all this morning. Glad y'all are joining us with your parents online. I want to show you a very special quilt that I have. Uh, this quilt was made uh, for me by the uh, women's quilting group that was very active here at our church for many years. Uh, they made this quilt for me uh, after my parents passed away. And it is a quilt I have enjoyed for a number of years now. It makes a great back throw, makes a great comforter on the bed. My, uh, my cat Minnie likes it too. And, uh, so it's great just to put over your lap when you're sitting in a chair reading in the evening. It uh, keeps you warm on chilly winter nights. When I use it, I kind of feel like my church family is uh, hugging me and keeping me warm. You know, uh, quilts and comforters and blankets are nice ways to stay warm on chilly evenings. And uh, Jesus is kind of like the uh, ultimate comforter when you think about it. Uh, Jesus is one who longs to reach out and hug us and keep us warm on the, uh, on the, chilly, in the chilly times of life when things are difficult. And of course, Jesus, uh, we can't feel Jesus physically hugging us. We know he's there spiritually. And one of the ways Jesus hugs us is through his people. If Jesus wants a person hugged and comforted, he does it through one of us. He works through us to bring comfort and hope to one another in difficult times. So the next time you have a you have a friend or a loved one who's feeling sad or discouraged, 
let Jesus work through you to be a comforter to me, to give them uh, hugs and encouragement and kind words to help them on their way. Because one of the greatest things Jesus does to those of us who are his people is to work through us to bring comfort and love and hope to one another. So the next time you wrap up in your favorite blanket, remember that Jesus is the ultimate comforter, and remember that Jesus uses us to comfort others. And now our next hymn is 424, Must Jesus Bear the Cross Alone? Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. How happy are the When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. 
The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. This is the word of God for the people of God. You know, Christians from the beginning of our faith have sung about their faith. Christians have always been a singing people. And with good reason, we have a faith to sing about. And I love all kinds of Christian music. I love the uh, majestic anthems of Bach. I love the gospel hymns of Fanny Crosby. I love the exuberant music of Mozart. I love the Appalachian sacred harp music. I love the uh, songs by Bill and Gloria Gaither that we often sing in church. I love the old camp meeting songs, the folk songs. I love the stately, dignified hymns of Charles Wesley and Isaac Newton's Amazing Grace. I love Celtic hymnody, which has a beauty all of its own. And out of all the different types of Christian music that's out there, one of the types that uh, speaks so powerfully to the feelings deep within our human souls is the spiritual that comes out of the African-American tradition. You know, African-American spirituals were written in times of sorrow and debilitating hardship. They cover the whole spectrum of human emotions, uh, joy and sorrow, victory and defeat, hope and despair, uh, that they're all there. And yet throughout all the African American spirituals, even the saddest of them, there resonates a note of hope, a note of promise, that good will ultimately triumph over evil, that the bad things in life do not have the final word that God wins in the end, and we share in God's victory. One of the uh, <coughs> great promises that you find in all the African American spirituals is the promise of a personal relationship with Jesus, the promise of Jesus' comforting presence with us in times of difficulty. You have songs like, uh, Nobody Knows the Trouble I've Seen, Nobody knows but Jesus. I want Jesus to walk with me in all my troubles, when my heart is almost broken, when my head is hanging low. I want Jesus to walk with me. And there's that dominant note of resurrection throughout the African American spirituals, the promise of ultimate victory at the end of all things. In that great waking up morning, fare thee well, fare thee well, swing low, sweet chariot, coming forth to carry me home. And the African American spirituals also seem to understand that resurrection is not just something we experience in the next life after we die in eternity, but we can experience the power of the resurrection right here and now in our daily life. That when things are weighing us down, when things are burdensome, when we are struggling with difficulties, Jesus is there with us in the midst of the struggles to give us the power of his resurrection, to walk us through those difficulties, to see us through the darkness to the mountaintop on the other side, to give us victory. And you see that in the story in John chapter 11 that we read a moment ago the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Jesus and his disciples received word from Mary and Martha the sisters of Lazarus that Lazarus who was a dear friend of Jesus Lazarus, Mary and Martha were among Jesus' closest friends this uh, brother and two sisters lived in Bethany a little town outside of Jerusalem and Mary and Martha send word to Jesus that Lazarus is really, really sick and the doctors don't think he's going to make it and they ask Jesus to come quickly. So Jesus and his disciples set out for Bethany, but by the time they arrive, Lazarus has already passed away. 
Mary and Martha meet Jesus as he comes into town. They're weeping. And they say, Lord, he's gone. If only you had been here, Lord, our brother would not have died. And Jesus weeps with the sisters. And then he asks them to show him where they have laid Lazarus. They take him to a, the tomb, which is, in the, which is a cave carved into the hillside on the outskirts of town with a great stone rolled across it. And Jesus says, roll away the stone. And Martha, who's always the practical one of the two sisters, says, Lord, this has been dead four days, and it's going to smell kind of bad. And Jesus says, believe and you will see the glory of God. Roll away the stone. So Martha and Mary get some strong men from the town to roll back the stone. Jesus prays, and then he says, to, and he shouts into the tomb, Lazarus, come on out. And to everyone's amazement, Lazarus walks out alive, still bound in the money like grave clothes he had been buried in. And Jesus tells Mary and Martha and the others, unbind him and let him go. The story shows us not only that death is not the end, that Jesus has a resurrection for us. It not only is a prediction of Jesus coming resurrection after the crucifixion. It also shows us how Jesus can bring us back to life when we feel defeated and dispirited in our daily lives. And it shows us how when we are going through difficult times, Jesus understands and feels our pain and understands our sorrow. It tells us that Jesus weeps with those who weep with his people when they are saved. And he still does today. In the King James Version of the Bible, verse 35 of John chapter 11 is the shortest verse of the, of the Bible. It consists of two words in the King James Version, Jesus wept. Now in later translations, like the New Revised Standard Version that we use here in church, uh, in many other modern English translations, it's translated as Jesus began to weep. But you know, there's just something powerful about the stark simplicity of the King James. Jesus wept. Those two words, the shortest verse in the Bible in the King James, say so much. Um, when I was a little child in Sunday school, growing up in Waco, Texas, our Sunday school teacher had a Bible memory contest going from week to week. Uh, every uh, Sunday morning, uh, he would ask all of us in the class, does anyone have a Bible verse memorized that they could quote for the class this morning? And if you could quote a Bible verse from memory and get the chapter and verse reference, you would get a gold star by your name on the bulletin board at the front of the class. Well, John chapter 11, verse 35 was my gold star verse. <laughs> uh, when the teacher would ask that, my hand would shoot up right away. I, I think I was probably in about the fifth or sixth grade this time. You know, my hand would shoot up right away. And he, had, he would call on me and I would say, John 11, 35, Jesus wept. And I'd get a gold star by my name. And all the other kids would give me dirty looks because I beat him to it. And uh, the next Sunday when the teacher asked, got my hand and go, John 11, 35, Jesus wept. And one day the teacher asked me, Travis, don't you know any other verses in the Bible besides John chapter 11, verse 35? And I said, yes, sir, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Now, you know, for most of us, most of us can quote John 11.35 and John 3.16 and the 23rd Psalm. If we can't quote anything else in the Bible, those are good verses to remember. But it's a powerful verse, even if it is the shortest in the King James Version. Now, uh, I teach a class of uh, ministerial students for the district, uh, clergy candidates who are preparing for ordination. And about a year or so ago, one of the students in my class told us all a story about an experience he had had. 
he was doing a summer internship at a larger church, a large church in our district. And uh, he was one of his duties he was assigned as a summer intern was to do the communion service on Sunday mornings in the church chapel. This church had a chapel besides a sanctuary, and they had a custom of offering communion before worship every Sunday morning in the uh, church chapel for those who wished to partake of it. And they had a laminated card on the pulpit for whatever preacher was officiating at the communion service to read from. It had the communion ritual printed out, the welcome, uh, the prayer of confession, the prayer of consecration. And then uh, when the preacher was ready to call down the people, uh, he would say, hear these words of comfort from the scripture. And that was left blank. So that whoever was officiating could share one of his or her own favorite verses of scripture at that point. While my student was doing the communion service that Sunday, and everything went well as he led the folks through the liturgy, and then he got to the point to call the people down and read, hear these words of comfort from the scripture. And his mind went blank. He could not remember anything. Now that's frightening for a seminary student, you understand. It's frightening for, me, frightening for any of us, but especially for a young seminary. He couldn't remember any scriptures or anything. And uh, he remembered the words to a Beatles song, but that, that wouldn't work. And uh, finally, he just blurted out the only scripture he could think of, Jesus wept. And he felt so bad, so awful, as he led the people through the rest of the service, feeling like he had really blown it. But then one of the church members came down to him when the service was dismissed and said, I just want you to know it meant so much to me this morning when you quoted that verse, Jesus wept. It reminded me that the healer of our time is also the feeler of our time. And I needed that because my mother just passed away recently. It's a powerful verse that reminds us that Jesus cares for us. He's with us and understands when we're hurting. There was an article in one of my preaching journals recently that was written by a pastor on the East Coast. He told about one of his most interesting experiences that his first pastorate. He had just got out of seminary with his degree. He was ordained. He had all this great theological knowledge he had accumulated in seminary. And he left ready to be super preacher. He was going to be the next Billy Graham. He was going to spout words of theological wisdom from the pulpit each Sunday, and he was going to change the world. He was assigned to a small rural congregation in his home study. And for the first few months he was there, you know, things went well. You know, he was preaching good sermons, people were liking his sermons, he was putting all that seminary knowledge he had got to use. And after he had been there a couple of years, he got a phone call early one morning. The father of his board chairperson <clears throat> had just passed away. He got in the car and drove over to their home to be with them. And as he was driving over there, he experienced some anxiety and fear. What am I going to say to them? I've never done a funeral service before. What am I going to say? I, I don't know what to say. And he began to try to desperately think back to all the notes he had from his pastoral ministry classes. and He just couldn't think of anything to say. He wanted to say some powerful theological words of comfort. And finally he decided, here's what I'll do. When I get to the house, I'll call all the family together in the living room. I'll quote the 23rd Psalm to them, and then I'll have a prayer. Yes, that's what I'll do. Well, he got to the house. He called the family together in the living room. Everything was going pretty well until he looked in the eyes of the gathered family. He saw their sorrow. He realized how much he had come to love these wonderful people over the past two years. Their pain suddenly became his pain. 
And he just managed to get out, the Lord is my shepherd, and he himself burst into tears. He cried uncontrollably. He couldn't stop. The tears were pouring down his face. The family had to comfort him. They helped him over to a couch and set him down, brought him a cool cloth to wipe his forehead. They, they brought him a glass of water. They patted him on the back and told him not to be upset, that everything was going to be okay. He felt so embarrassed. He had really blown his thought. Somehow he made it through the rest of that week and got through the funeral service. And the very next week he went to the district superintendent and asked to be transferred to another church. He felt he had failed miserably. Well, the next year he was moved to another church. And for the next few years he avoided that family at annual conference. He just couldn't bear to look him in the face. He felt he had failed them. But one year at annual conference, he rounded the corner, and there they were, coming down the hall, right towards him. They saw him. He couldn't avoid them this time. And he steeled himself into what he was sure was going to be some uh, telling you what's on our mind stuff. But instead, to his amazement, their faces broke out in the widest smiles. They rushed to him, they embraced him, they said, Oh, we are so glad to see you. We have missed you so much. We've loved all of our pastors, but we love you most of all. Because we will never forget the day that you cried with us when Grandfather died. You see, when people are in pain, they don't want theological pronouncements. They don't want deep discussions of the meaning of life and death. They just want someone to cry with them. Someone to feel their pain. Someone to let them know they're not alone. That it's going to be okay. That's what Jesus does for us. And it's what Jesus wants to do for others through us. You know, uh, Jesus, when He led the disciples in Holy Communion, First Holy Communion, the night before his crucifixion. He said, This is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for you. And he said, Do this in remembrance of me. When Jesus said, Do this in remembrance of me, I think he meant take Holy Communion regularly to remember me. But I think he also meant Remember me by living lives of sacrificial service. Remember me by living lives of service and compassion to others. As my body was broken for you, be broken in compassion for others. Jesus wants to hug other people through you and me. He wants to comfort others through you and me. And we are comforting one another in times of sorrow. We are following in the footsteps of Jesus. When Jesus wants someone comforted in a difficult time, He most often does it through one of His people. There is a little boy named Tommy who was sitting on a park bench one day watching other kids play softball. And an elderly gentleman came up and sat down next to him they chatted for a while about the softball game the kids were playing, about the weather, about things going on in their little town. And the older gentleman said, Tommy, if you could have just three wishes granted right now, what would those three wishes be? Tommy thought for a moment. He said, well, first, I would wish for peace in our world. Second, I would wish that everybody in the world would come to know Jesus. And third, I would wish that my best friend Johnny, who is blind, could see. The older gentleman looked puzzled. He didn't understand Tommy's answer. And he excused himself and got up and walked away with a puzzled look on his face. And Tommy couldn't understand, or Tommy couldn't understand why the older gentleman was puzzled by what he had seen. And then he picked up his crutches and hobbled away home. Now where did Tommy learn to love like that? 
He learned it in church. He learned it from Jesus. Jesus wants us to love and show compassion to one another. Robert, Roberto de Vicenzo was a great Argentine golfer who won many awards. And after he had won one golf tournament, he received the award check of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, he was on his way out to his car after the tournament when a young woman approached him with tears in her eyes and said, uh, Mr. Davis Senzo, it's a happy day for you, but it's a sad day for me. I have just come from the hospital. I've been told my little baby girl there has cancer. She needs medical treatment to survive. But, but I have no money and no insurance. I don't know what I'm going to do. And without a moment's hesitation, Roberto David Senzo signed his check for hundreds of thousands of dollars over to her and gave it to her and said, take the money and go do what is best for your child. Well, some of David Senzo's friends had overheard this exchange and they were suspicious. So they checked around and found out the woman didn't even have a little girl. She was a con artist. She had just tricked Roberto de Vicenzo out of hundreds of thousands of dollars. His friends came to him and said, Roberto, we have sad news. That woman doesn't have a little girl. She's a con artist. She just tricked you out of all that money. And Roberto de Vicenzo said, you mean to say there's no baby girl in the hospital dying of cancer? And they said, no. And he said, that's the best news I've heard all week. That is wonderful news. Now, where did Roberto de Senzo learn that kind of selfless love? He learned it from Jesus. A man once called his pastor and told him that uh, his wife had just given birth at the hospital to their firstborn, a baby boy. The baby boy was born without a right ear. He was healthy in every other way. Uh, there was an auditory hole there, and all the inner workings of the ear were inside. He could hear on that side, but there was no ear outside. The doctors told the parents not to worry that they could do an ear transplant and uh, give the boy an ear, but they would have to wait until the boy was an adult and a suitable donor would have to be found. Well, as the years passed and the boy grew up, he was teased mercilessly by other children. And he went to college. He studied to be a geologist. And one day his father called him and told him to hurry home that a donor had been found and the doctors said they could do the surgery. So the young man rushed home. The surgery was performed. He had an ear. He went back to college, he graduated with honors, and he became a successful geologist. Well, years passed, and one day his father called him and told him his mother had just had a massive heart attack and to hurry home. He flew home right away, but by the time he got there, sadly, his mother had passed away. Before the funeral service, he and his father were at the funeral home standing in the viewing room looking at his mother's body in her casket. And the father gently brushed his wife's hair back. And the boy saw in his amazement that his mother did not have a right ear. His father said to him, she made me promise never to tell you while she lived. But now I think you should know that she was the donor who gave you your right ear. No one will ever have to tell that man what sacrificial love is all about. He knows. And when we live in the spirit of sacrificial love, performing common acts of courtesy and kindness and offering comfort to one another in times of sorrow, we are living in the spirit of Jesus. Holy Communion that we celebrate this morning reminds us of where we get the strength to live in that way. It reminds us of Jesus' sacrifice for us. The bread we'll receive is the body of Christ broken for us. The cup we'll drink is the blood of Christ shed for us. Just as they become part of us when we eat and drink them, so Jesus goes with us when we leave this place to give us His strength to live. Uh, Ed's going to assist me in Holy Communion. And after Ed and I have uh, 
serve each other, Holy Communion, you may file by, and we will give you the packet that you can take back to your seat as we share communion together. And remember, peel up the bottom of the chalice and take out the bread, and then peel the top off to drink the grape juice. And uh, we will share communion together in this way. And the uh, offering plates here on the pew if you wish to contribute to the offering for Shepherd's Heart this morning. This is the body and blood of Christ given for us. Oh, rugged cross, I will ever be. 
for a crown. And now in the grace of God and the love of Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you now and always. Amen. Go in peace and stay safe.